So, Nita, how are you doing today? I'm good. So exciting to be here, Gaurav. Thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure. In fact, I remember the first time I heard about you. That was like four years back. And then I got an <laughs> yeah. opportunity to pick up your book. And uh, from that day, I became a fan of yours. I always wanted to get in touch with you so that I can learn from the horse's mouth. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I would love to talk about your book, which is Emotional Grit. Uh, mm -hmm. However, before we get there, I'm just curious, um, how is US coping up with COVID-19 pandemic? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's an unprecedented time, you know, it's, an, it's, it's a crazy time right now. And it's, um, I think it's affecting us at all different levels, because we're, we're so, you know, as a, as a, as a community, as a, as a country, and as um, even, you know, everybody around the world, I think that there's this mentality of go, go, go. And we're constantly go, go, go. And, hmm. you know, so, you know, the process of going inward and not going outside, you can't go outside, so you go inside, is a concept that not very many people are used to. So definitely this is bringing up a lot of emotions. Um, a lot of strain, a lot of stress, especially if people have utilized work and busyness and distractions to hide behind their, their emotions and their feelings and even to really have meaningful relationships and, and have that presence. Uh, so it's, it's been interesting. And I think even for, for us, uh, between um, my husband and I, it's brought up different ways to navigate even each other. Uh, not only that, but also uh, to, to really navigate and, and to practice what we preach, but to take the time to pause because we, we don't ever pause. And, you know, the whole, the, you know, the conversation around um, knowing when to pause so that you can push when you need to and knowing when to give yourself permission um, and not shame yourself if you're not feeling uh, motivated or if you're not feeling inspired to do things. I think that as leaders, though, I mean, it is our responsibility to provide that space for uh, motivation and inspiration because a lot of people are like freezing up at this time because they've either never gone through something so dire and, 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 and drastic. I think this is something we've all never had in our lives uh, collectively as a whole in the world. But I do have to say that, you know, this people have gone through a lot worse. And for us to stay inside, uh, yes, it's forcing us to do something that is not within our will. Uh, but there are other things that have happened in, in people's lives that are much more you know, gravitating and, yeah. and horrifying than what's happening right now. And what's happening yeah. right now yeah. is horrifying because lives are being lost and, and there's, there's so many things that uh, I'm sure that even your listeners have had crazy stories of triumph, of adversity, of setbacks uh, to really kind of uh, build their strength during this time. So this, I feel like, is kind of a metaphor for how we can go inward. Yeah, yeah. And you know, every time when people talk about my views uh, for COVID-19 uh, pandemic, and I often tell them that this is the time in the history of the mankind that in case we don't change in this moment, in this phase, I don't know which phase is going to change our ways of looking at life, our ways of approaching the world, our ways of talking to our own self. That's one. Second is, I think this is the true test of our character because I've seen so many motivational speakers. I've seen people who are attending the workshops, attending the courses from one course to another, moving from one door to another and talking about positive psychology, talking about inspiration and motivation. And those are the people right now, they're saying that hey, nothing is going to work. It's, these are really dark times. And I tell them, hey, for God's sake, look at what might happen, right? What might be possible. And here you are, uh, who has gone through several dark patches in your life, and saying that, okay, this is the true time to reflect, to talk to yourself, sit with your family members and check with them. How are they doing? And uh, yeah, it's the true test of character. And something that you said really beautiful, you know, as humanity, I think these are the worst experiences, right? But the individual level, I'm sure people have gone through much terrifying, painful experiences. Mm -hmm. And I would be stupid not to ask this question. Is there any episode in your life that you can relate with, which was as horrifying 
as painful as mm-hmm. what the humanity is facing collectively? Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, if I if I go through all the instances, I think this will be a really long podcast. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, I think that I was built for this moment. Uh, I was built for this moment in so many ways. And it doesn't even compare to what I have seen. And, and which is why I think it's kind of while there are so many, uh, you know, tools and building blocks and and strategies that I've been sharing, you know, the last uh, month with people and even our own communities and what I talk about in my book. Uh, it's so evident as of right now, because um, I mean, it's the things that I had lived through and I'd gone through myself uh, to really know and establish that uh, you know, it wasn't just one time, it wasn't two times, it wasn't three times, it was a period of it's been marked by um, adversities and setbacks and challenges. And I think it's really what has led me to the work that I'm doing today. And so yeah, I grew up very early. Um, at 10 years old, I was a caretaker to my mom. Uh, and she was, uh, we were, we were born and raised in Chicago and my mother was from the Philippines. My father was from, from Delhi actually. And so, you know, they had this multicultural, um, lifestyle and there was the, the three of us. Uh, I was the oldest of two younger brothers and, but I had to grow up early. My mom had, had breast cancer and she battled that for, uh, you know, for about six years on and off. And, um, so at 14, the cancer came back and at 16, she, she passed. So I was, I was 16 years old and here I am, you know, I'm a junior in high school, uh, barely getting my driver's license. Mm-hmm. And um, now I had to lead, I had to be the mom of this woman of the house. And my father was a traditional, mm-hmm. you know, Indian father. He was so distraught. Uh, he, I mean, this, he, you know, this love of his life was just taken away. He went into a deep depression. And so I had to really take care of my two younger brothers and my father. And so I was working odd jobs. Uh, In the US, you can work really early. So I started working at 15, actually 14 scooping ice cream. Uh, and then I was working for a dentist at a dental office. Um, but at, at uh, a year later, my brother, uh, DJ, he suddenly collapsed uh, in front of his high school doors. And this was during like a big, you know, um, football dance. And we were supposed to meet that day because I was a senior in high school then. And he just never made it. And so uh, this was, I mean, it was so devastating. It, uh, if I recall the actual instances and the times, like it just, uh, I, I thought that we were just paralyzed at that moment because it was only a year uh, later that my brother died after my mom died. Mm. And so, you know, there's, it was so horrible. It was awful because we just, we were just kind of going through this and all of a sudden you have sudden death. My, my brother was healthy. He may have had asthma growing up, but he wasn't really even using his inhaler. So it was a very tragic moment and it really set us back. My father, it really took him uh, it just, it, it, it completely tore his heart in so many places. And, and there I was, I was a senior in high school. I was wanting to leave, uh, you know, where I was living because I had to grow up so early. So I thought this was my chance. And at that moment I said, I, I can't, I have to stay here. So I ended up going to college in Chicago, um, taking care of now my youngest brother who was, um, who was 12 at the time and, uh, my dad. And so, so as we're going through this pain and this really dark road, it was just, you know, there were moments where you, you feel so, um, that, that when is this going to end? I I remember that I would wake up Mm. mornings and thinking, am I going to lose somebody else today? Uh, you know, there were times where the phone would ring because I was so used to getting terrible calls on the phone. That's Mm -hmm. how my father told me my mom was dying. Um, that's how I got a phone call that I was at my, my friend's house and my brother was being rushed to the hospital before he passed. So, so the, this fear that I had with, you know, there's the phones ringing. Why are they calling? Oh my God, something's happening. That was a visceral fear for, for years. And Mm -hmm. then the worst fear came true because two years later, my brother and I were, we were, we were starting to kind of go out again as a family. So there was this family wedding we were going to. And we said, you know what, we're going to show our faces and we're going to just 
try to celebrate and have some happy times as a family. And so, um, uh, yeah, we, we, we dyed my dad's hair, um, you know, black because he had silver gray hair at this point. He kind of mm-hmm. looked like George Clooney, I'd like to say, but darker, much darker. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> He, uh, and we, my, my little brother dyed his hair and I mean, what happened would be, you know, kind of this, uh, this crazy story, which was, um, my dad's face reacted really heavily Mm -hmm. to dye and his face blew up twice the size. And so in a span of a few minutes, we were just like, we were in shock. We were like, what do we do? We call the ambulance, but Throughout all that time, we're, you know, we're, we, we get to the hospital and he's in the emergency room and they basically, the doctors tell us like, you know, your, your, your father's fine, but we had to do some routine tests and, uh, we found stage four lung cancer. And at that point I was like, kill me now. Like, why is this happening? There's just, there's so much anger. And I, I, I remember I, I was a very hot headed teenager. I had so many emotions that was running through my veins and I was like screaming at the doctors and cause I couldn't believe it. I said, there's no way this is not happening. This is not happening. This is like the worst nightmare that's never ending. And so, uh, I mean, you can only imagine, uh, the, and we were just in shock and disbelief. My father was like feeling the very best that he's ever felt in his life. Um, he had stopped smoking. He was eating better. He was jogging, you know, five miles a day. I mean, he was in the best spirits. And then we have this news that the cancer was inoperable. It was in his lungs. And so, um, and they said he had, uh, you know, nine months to live. And basically he died later that year. Um, exactly as they said. So it was, um, I was, so I was 19 and we're orphaned. Um, my brother was 14. So it was, a uh, it was definitely tough. And, um, but we were surrounded by so much love. And I think that was the biggest thing that got us through that time. Uh, we had started going to therapy when we were young, when we had lost my brother. Uh, and so we kind of grew up with therapy. We, we grew up with, with a lot of my aunts and uncles to this day, my bua and my chachas and, you know, and, and on my mom's side, my, my grandmothers who obviously now are no longer alive, but they were the ones who really stepped in to take care of us. And so that really kind of shaped and transformed a mm. lot of life lessons. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Nita, thank you for sharing something which is like really deep and uh, something I don't know how to describe this phase of your life, but as a teenager of 19 years, what was your first reaction to this, what was happening around you and what meaning did you create for yourself? For me, it was like, I lost a family. I lost my family. I have to recreate this family. Um, And that was the meaning that I had. I need to recreate a family. And, you know, the other meaning that I created was I'm not going to let people pity the Bushin Kandan. Like that was my, like, you know, I don't want people to you know, come up and say, oh, bitchada, oh, bitchadi, you know, like, oh, she's been through so much. I didn't want to pass. I didn't want just a, a free pass. I wanted to. And so I think I overcompensated in my twenties where I worked a lot and I hmm. overworked and overworked. And hmm. it was also my coping mechanism. Yeah, I'm sure. Probably- Avoiding the grief, because yeah. uh, it's a lot of grief for somebody uh, throughout so, the years. So here are, I've got two questions. One is, from where did you get all this grit for yourself that I'm not <laughs> going to let people pity on Bhushan Khandan, as you said? And second thing is, what was the passage that you picked up that helped you to become a dentist and that too, especially a cosmetic dentist? Yeah, so I think that the the upbringing that I had with my father, my my grandfather was a uh, an ambassador to UNICEF, and so he traveled a lot. He traveled a lot outside of India, and um, he met a lot of the world leaders. He was a diplomat, so he was only in India once a year when my throughout the life of my father before my father left India, and so that was a really big. Uh, shape for my father's beliefs of, you know, high regard, pride, legacy, you know, building and leaving. So we were, from a very young age, we were taught like, you're, you're Bushin, you're strong, you're, 
Um, my dad would always say like, you know, it doesn't matter how much it costs as long as it's educational driven, like educational success was the pinnacle, pinnacle, pinnacle of what you can do. So, uh, so even throughout all the losses, I mean, we channeled our energy early on with my dad being that cheerleader for us uh, into studies because that was kind of his way of helping us with the grief. And I think it was also his way of maybe knowing that, and maybe that was his biggest fear that he would, he would die um, leaving us behind, especially after my mom died. Uh, so that was something that he really instilled in us early on. Educational drive and success were the, were, were the very big things that mattered in life simply because he got that from my, my grandfather. If I think about what I heard from you until now, it feels like learning is an indispensable principle and a pillar for those who want to control their lives. And I feel your father told that to you in a certain way. Even within the organization that I run, which is called X Monks, we encourage learning through free webinars that we call Coaching Matters. And now I see that education can help people and they need not be just those working in the coaching industry. It is for everyone who would want to transform and make a difference to their life. Anyway, coming back to our discussion. And if there's an unasked question from your father, what could that be? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think that uh, for many years, I, I thought that that question was, is he proud? Is he proud? Hmm. Is he proud? Because for all of my 20s, it was, you know, living this life and trying to prove and trying to kind of have your chip on your shoulders of I'm going to be even more successful or I'm going to have this idea of whatever success is in, in their eyes, which is doctor, hmm. dentist, lawyer, engineer, whatever that looks like. So those that traditional sense. And that's really what was that mantra that kept me going on, which, which led me into service. Um, it led me into becoming a, you know, a dentist, going to dental school, um, and that too, not giving up, not giving up on, on studies, trying to be the, the, the best of the best. And, yeah. and that led me to open up a, even a practice before I was 30. Uh, because of that, just that was that mantra in the back of my head of, is he proud? Is he proud? I'm going to make them proud. My parents proud. Like I was living this ghost of my parents um, for, for years, for years, because my immediate family, my, my aunts and uncles, they didn't really have that pressure for me. They just, they just wanted us to be happy um, in some ways. Of course, there's a little bit of that pressure that comes by being Asian, yeah. but uh, it was mostly that, that question, that mantra that I carried on for. Is really he proud years. of me? And in fact, I think most of the Indians, at least, we live with this pressure. Is my, is my dad proud of me? Is my mother proud of me? Is my aunt, is my uncle, are they proud of me? And before the stretch it, are my neighbors proud of me? So, you know, I'm really curious to understand. You also mentioned that you worked really hard in your 20s and by 30s, you had a cosmetic dental practice. And it's not just an other cosmetic dental practice. You had a multi-million dollar um, cosmetic dental practice. So I'm just curious. You said that was a coping mechanism for me. So what is it that you were trying to avoid? Yeah, I think I was trying to avoid the depths of sorrow and sadness and and possibly even emptiness that I had avoided for so long. And I think I reached that rock bottom when I found myself, you know, after reaching all of those things, and that was very early. It was even before I was 30 actually. I was I I was married and I, you know, wanted to have I think, remember, I, I just said, I, you know, the two things that I wanted was to make my parents proud, my dead parents proud, and also to recreate a family. And so I'd met a man, and this was a kind of uh, how, I, how I led many of my relationships uh, early on. I didn't want to let things go because I was so afraid of being mm. alone. Yeah. And so, uh, so that meant that whatever relationship I was in, I would hold on to it for a very long time because probably of the fear. Too long. because of the fear of of being yeah. alone and, um and, and i think the fear of loss 
definitely. Yeah, and, the, and the meaning that I'm listening is that if I love somebody, uh, the universe might snatch it away from me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, mm-hmm. absolutely. And so that was a big belief block that I definitely was running with. And so I got into really unhealthy relationships, um, and they they would often overlap. So one would end, and then I would immediately go into another. And yeah. this kind of led me to get married, you know, early on. And uh, and that person would teach me everything I needed to know about self-love, uh, the love that I would un- unknowingly and just generously pour into other people because that's what you're taught. As a Desi girl, you're taught happiness is not you. Happiness is for mummy and papa, for, you know, bua ji and, and, and fufa ji and masis and everybody else, not you. You don't matter. Yeah. You're happy when everybody else is happy. And so I continuously yeah. do that. Yeah. And um, once you're married, then it's for your husband. Once you've got kids, then it's for your kids and for your in-laws. So where is the life for you? There is none. Yeah. Then there, what happened? There, there, yeah. And I, I think that um, things had to get worse before it got better. And so it was December 31st, uh, very viscerally remembered that this was like a life or this was a very life altering situation. It was like a life or death situation. I, uh, you know, I was already, he had already threatened uh, me and it was a dangerous situation. And at this point, my brother came to know of the violence and abuse and I had to make a decision. I had to really think, what is, why am I doing all of this? And I, for the first time, literally, you know, it's December 31st, it's New Year's Eve, everyone's going out and partying and all of these things. And I'm frantic in my bedroom um, while my brother is packing up as, as many things as possible uh, because um, my ex-husband wasn't in the house at that time. And, uh, and my brother actually said, if you don't leave, I will tell everyone, I will tell Boo and I will tell, you know, because I kept it all a secret. I was so ashamed that I was living through this, uh, that I didn't want anybody to know. And I had to really look at myself and say, oh my God, like, this is who I am. And this is, this is what I've, this is what I've become. Like, I have all of this stuff on the outside that people would be like, wow, she's done so well. But on the inside, I was crumbling. I didn't know who I was. I was spiritually dead. I was emotionally distraught. And physically, I was a wreck. Um, And I knew that that had to be the last day that I was going to live for other people. You knew it deep down. Yeah, I knew it deep down. And I knew that something had to change. But see, so for, for women and people who have have been in battered or abusive relationships and don't really have that self-confidence because my confidence was at an all-time low, 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 low. And it doesn't matter how professional you are, all the accolades. At the end of the day, I wanted love and I trusted this person, you know, to provide that. But what I didn't do is I never loved myself. And that's what a lot of women and men, they, they forget to love yeah. themselves. When you forget to love yourself, you don't, you, you have no idea. Yeah. Um, so that was when I said, I, I, it, the fear was so great. The fear of staying was great and the fear of leaving was the great because you don't know what's going to happen on the other side. You just know that it has to be better than what you're actually going through. And so that was the day that I said, okay, I'm doing this for me. I'm doing everything for me. And as painful as it was, as hard as it was, I had to just trust my inside and trust myself and say, okay, this is it. So I took whatever I could that night and packed everything in the car. And that's literally what would be my home for the next two weeks, even though, and I had a fancy Mm -hmm. car, it was a BMW, um, had this fancy car (laughs) and all of my stuff is there. Uh, But I was so ashamed. And that's what happens when you have a lot of shame and guilt for doing something. You don't want to tell anybody because you're afraid. What will everybody think? Yeah. And that's another uh, pandemic the world is living in. And while I was listening to you, either this reminds me, I've got several friends. Uh, they went through some really uh, deep adversities in their life. And I often share with them that either you can live your life from a space of resentment or you can live your life from a space of acceptance and then taking a stand for what you really care for. And what I heard you saying is an example of deep down, there was resentment. There was a belief that 
anybody that I really love and care for, the universe would snatch it away from me. Mm-hmm. And then I'm looking for true love in them. It's a vicious circle because deep down the assumptions are different. But what I'm doing is to get something. But unconsciously, and this is how the deepest patterns of an individual, the deepest assumptions of an individual, the unconscious creates a different life for you. And the moment you said that uh, this is the last day I'm going to live for somebody else, uh, you made a decision. You actually made a declaration. Yeah, it it was the declaration to myself. And it was the declaration that okay, I, I am strong. And that's, that's the mantra that, you know, I, I started from that day onward. And that, that mantra carried me, that, that mantra carried me on until I met my amazing partner and my co-pilot in life. Hmm. Um, but that mantra was, because that would be the start of the deepest, darkest days. That's literally when I went into depression and I didn't even realize that it was depression until probably a few years ago because you just, you're, you're at the lowest of the lowest and the bottom of the bottom. But it it was so amazing because now it was like, I'm doing this on my own. And there was such ownership in that and to actually experience all of those feelings that I had locked up in my in myself for a decade. It was a decade of distraction, a decade of doing, a decade of all of those things. I'm surprised I just physically didn't get sick because I had had bottled up all of this in my heart for so many years. And that would be the start of being able to discover who I was and what I wanted. Yeah. So Nita, this this is a very interesting conversation and I'm going to steer this conversation in another direction because I'm sure the audience who are listening to us right now, they can extract a lot. You know, there are so many people that I come across, they're not at all happy. Deep down, they're living with resentment Mm -hmm. and they're not happy with their life. They're not happy in their relationship. They're not happy with their financial status. They're not happy with the spiritual health. They're not happy with the circle that they mingle with. And yet they don't do anything about that. Mm. And here you were doing really well for yourself, uh, leading a multi-dollar uh, cosmetic dental practice. And then one day you decided that enough is enough. How did you seize that moment for yourself? What was the trigger? How did you get that message from the universe that this is the moment? And if I skip this moment, I'm going to get to another drain, which is not at all desired. And I don't deserve that. Yeah. So there's, there's something that I talk about a lot is, you know, you have three different mindsets, right. And, and it, and it comes from uh, Carol Dweck and she's a, she's a Stanford professor and she's wrote this book about mindset, which was so fascinating for me. And, And when I read that, that completely changed everything. But I talk, she talks about, you know, a growth mindset and a fixed mindset. And what I tend to talk about is, uh, when you are open to, um, and I've, I've kind of extrapolated into three different mindsets. There's victim, survivor, and thriver. When you've gone through something, when you've, when you've, when you've just escaped a situation, you're in the victim mindset. Maybe you're not taking a responsibility. You're blaming things on the other person. It was all their wrongdoing. And, oh my gosh, I can't believe this happened to me. And you feel sorry for yourself. And then you move into a survivor mindset where the survivor mindset is just they're they're they've they've gone past something they've gotten past something they've lived through something and now they're just trying to rebuild their life and then you get into a thriving mindset now a thriving mindset is all focused on growth they are focused on growth and they are focused on their this unsatiable thirst um, to really quench their thirst for, for massive growth because they're flourishing and they want, want to flourish in life. And so for me, when I hit that rock bottom in those days, it was all about how can I grow myself? Because, you know, what got me here, as Marshall Goldsmith says, won't get me there. And I didn't know that at the time, right? I just knew that what got me where I was is not where I need to be going. Like I need to do something completely different, some completely that I've never been open to, that I've never done before. Yeah. And literally some of those things that I was doing, I had to make new friends because I had left my whole old life. I had to 
for all myself, I started taking improv classes, which gave me a lot of confidence so much. If anybody has ever taken an improvisation class, you know, you do silly things for three hours and you learn how to make fun of yourself. And for my entire life, for 10 years, everything was very serious. So I barely even knew how to make fun of myself. We, and I started to know that I'm kind of really silly in, inside. I've just never given myself permission to let that out. And that was one of the first things that, that kind of grew my brain in terms of, oh, wow, I, I don't have to care what anybody thinks. This is all about me. And, and yes, if I can be funny, I can be funny, but this is all about being present in the moment. And that's really what improv taught me that I'm entitled to an opinion and you're entitled to your opinion and I'm going to be present with you and we're just going to kind of dance together. And, uh, and that was getting me out of myself. And there's so many other examples that I have of that, but being, when you're open to growing, when you're open to growing, that just means that, and this is where grit comes in, grow, reveal, innovate, and transform. G is the first in that acronym, but when you're open to growing, that means you are aware of everything around you. You are aware that this is not where I want to be. And from that place, you accept where you're at so you can make a change. So awareness and acceptance are the first two steps to reach where you want to reach. So Nita, help me understand. There are so many people, as I mentioned, who are living their life from a space of resentment. Yeah. Right? Yeah. They would have lost somebody very, very close. They would have gone through some really terrible times in their professional life or in their personal life, right? What is, what is your advice to them? How should they deal with this resentment, which is deep grounded within? Yeah, I think that, you know, for, so for, for somebody who's going through something really deep and, and this is a setback that's kind of pulling you down, you have two choices. You know, you have two choices. You can beat yourself up and you can swim in those feelings of, oh my gosh, I can't believe this happened. This happened to me. My life's never going to be better. All of these things. That's the victim mindset. That's poor me, poor me, poor me. What happened to me? And those feelings are valid. I first want to say those feelings are valid, but then you've got to put them aside. You know, I, 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 I there's this tool that I talk about honor, experience, detach, and let go. This is a process to really be able to honor those feelings and honor those feelings of betrayal, of darkness, of sadness, of, of, you know, of depth, of depression. But then from there, what did that teach you? What did falling teach you? What did, because that's how we build resilience. And that's, you know, one of the foremost things that I talk about now in building mental fitness and even growing your grit is how many times can you fall to get back up? Because if you've got another mountain to climb, if you want to change the way, you know, Wayne Dyer says this, if, if you want to change the way you look at things, you've got to, you've got to change what you're looking at. You've got to change your perspective around it. You've got to be able to look at the situation and say, how can I do something completely different instead of beating myself up? Because most of the time we're not forgiving ourselves and we're so hard on ourselves and we're not giving ourselves that self-compassion that we're entitled to that. You know what? I, I did make a mistake. You know what? I was in a bad situation. You know what? I did make a bad decision, but that bad decision or that bad thing doesn't define me. I met my ex-husband and maybe there were times where I cursed him out or, or said, how can he do this to me? But for the most part, I'm so grateful for that experience because without that experience, I would not be able to be having this chat with you today, Gaurav. I would not be yeah. able to inspire as many people. You know, and a lot of times we hold on to those stories and we think that they define us and that's our defining moment in life. No. It's just a setback. It's a pebble in the road. It's a pebble in the road that caused a flat tire. And it's up to you to get that tire fixed. Or you could just keep trying to drive with that flat tire and you're not going to go anywhere. You're going to keep going in circles and circles and circles. Or you can get that tire fixed. And then you can say, okay, that was a small patch in the bumpy road ahead. But that bumpy road is going to come and you're going to see all of the flowers on the right side and the left side. And you're going to see all the beauty because now the car that you have with all its patchwork is, is, is beautiful. And that's you and that's unique to you because it holds all of your stories as well. Yeah. And as you said that, no, there are a lot of learning that I picked up from this conversation. 
And um, as you said that what got you here will not get you there. And I often share with people who got you here won't get you there. So in what we talk about the beliefs or the assumptions at the who level, I just, we just, we, I just talk about the identity, who you are being in this conversation or who you are being in life that uh, led you to live a life that you are living. So my key takeaways still now, right now, are one is you said that learn to live your life from a space of acceptance rather than living your life from a space of resentment. Yeah, yeah. So when you're open to growing, it reveals your greatness ah. because your greatness is already within you. And it's a matter of giving yourself permission to unveil and reveal what you've always were meant to be. And most of the time, we never go and we never have a reflection or we never have introspection. We're always, we're, you know, in our culture and even, you know, with Bollywood movies, you're taught even at five years old that Prince Charming or this beautiful woman is going to sweep you off your feet and, and you're going to go chasing after her and chasing after her or chasing after him and you're going to leave your family and it's so dramatic and it's beautiful because it's Bollywood. But what about you? What about spending time like hugging yourself? What about spending time getting to know what you like? Because, and I get this all the time on my DMs on Instagram and you know, people kind of chat a lot with me over there. And, and a lot of times they are chatting about, oh, my, my, you know, uh, the, I'm, I'm still in a, in its terrible relationship or I, I got divorced and I'm never going to find anybody. When you carry that, n I'm never going to find anybody. Yeah. That's a belief. And You're then you will never it. find anybody. You're You're, yeah. That's it. That's going to come. That's going to be yeah. that. That's your mantra, right? Yeah. So remember my mantra was I am bold. I am beautiful and I am brave. Literally. I swear that was what I shared within my life. When I, when I first got my first small little one bedroom apartment outside of this five story home that I was living in, the first three things that I had was my bed my pillow and my TV. And that was the three things that I got after my divorce. Yes. Um, and that was the three things that I said was I'm brave, I'm beautiful and, and, and I'm bold. And that you've got to change your mantra. You've got to yeah. change the, the, the narrative that you are just continuing on in your life. Yeah. So it's a beautiful line when you said, when you're, when you're open to growing, it reveals your greatness. And then you also spoke about the three mindsets of an individual where you spoke about having a victim mindset or a survivor or a thriver. And something that you said really beautifully, you said, face the fear and make fun of yourself. And you might always have two choices. Either you can beat yourself and swim in those emotions or honor them, experience them, detach yourself and let go and do something completely different. So in the next phase, Nita, um, there's a rapid question round for you. And after that, cool. we are going to get into the second phase of your life where you are today one of the known coaches, one of the known entrepreneurs, one of the known trainers, and um, very well-known um, author that you are. So would love to get into that space as well. So here is a rapid round for you, right? What does life mean to you in one word? Love. One word that comes to your mind when you think of love? Acceptance. What does family mean to you? Global. What does breakdowns signify? Opportunity. Your favorite book? There's many. <laughs> The power of now. Beautiful. Eckhart Tolle, I'm in love with this guy. Your favorite color? Purple. Who do you miss the most? I would say my brother. What does God mean to you? Mm, expansive. Who do you go to when you are really sad? <sighs> Friends. Who is the biggest source of happiness for you? My husband. Beautiful. Thank you so much. <laughs> and you have cleared all the 10 questions, Nita. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you spoke about self-love, self-compassion a couple of times. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious, what is self-love for you? What is self-compassion for you? Yeah, so I would say, so I'll start with compassion first. Um, I would say self-compassion is really the, giving yourself the permission to fall uh, being kind and gentle with yourself because many times we are the biggest critics. We are the biggest critics and we are so much harder on ourselves than what the world um, may be on the outside. And we try to many times push, 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 push and keep going and keep going and keep going. Um, and what compassion really is, is the understanding 
that you're doing the best that you can. And when you can have and grasp that concept, I'm doing the best that I can, then nothing has been wasted. Nothing has been a failure. Nothing has been terrible. Um, that every single day in each moment you can start over. Like if we didn't like this moment, I can say, you know what, I'm going to have compassion for myself and let's just, let's just start that over. And we fail to do that even in our, in our relationships or in our conversations or our interactions with people. We, we tend to hold grudges and we tend to hold things and we even tend to hold things on ourselves that, ah, oh, I failed this test. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do terrible or I'm not really that good in relationships. He's not going to like me. She's not going to like me. Never mind. I'm not, not even going to do that. We don't have that compassion for ourselves that, you know what, this moment is a brand new moment. And in this moment, I can be whoever I want. And I am going to be completely different. I'm going to be amazing. I'm going to be thoughtful. I'm going to be prosperous. I'm going to be abundant, whatever. But like have uh, taking that into account that each moment is, is so different and that um, you have a new opportunity. That's what having compassion is to be able to understand uh, yourself. Through. I can resonate with you so much. And also, <laughs> especially, especially when you said one word that comes to your mind when you think of love. If you would have asked me the same question, in just one breath, I would have said acceptance. Mm -hmm. uh, and my friends, my colleagues, they make fun of me because every time when they talk about anything that happened in the past, any uh, regret that they have either for themselves or any blame or complaint that they have for anybody else, I tell them, just drop it. Just drop it. Mm -hmm. Restart. Start again in this moment. Because you can, I, I think it's ingrained in our blood and in our culture that we have to carry on all of that baggage and that weight. And right now, if you're listening to this, this is your permission. This is what you've been waiting for. You can actually cut those ties. You can cut those things. There were, there, there were, when I left my, you know, when I left my um, first marriage and when I even left the profession of dentistry, there were people in my life, like I had to stop speaking to even my own Bua for a while. I had to stop speaking to her and I love her so much. She's like my mom and we still, we have the best relationship today. But back then I had to cut those ties to really protect myself. Yes. And that was, a, a, you know, and that's something that many people may not want to do, or it might clash because of your family values and things like that. But that's what love is. That's what self-love is, is accepting yourself and putting and prioritizing your needs first. And if in that moment, it means to separate from people that are toxic or negative or cancerous to your overall well-being, then so be it. Because we are living in a different world in a different time. And some people might say, well, Nita, what about respect and respecting your elders? And you can respect them, but you don't have to agree with them. And when you don't agree with them, you don't have to abide by what they're saying about you because yeah. your beliefs on yourself should be much stronger yeah. than anybody else. And, and not at the cost of your well-being, as you said. Yeah, so, so important. Yeah. So Nita, help me understand here, everything was going really well for you. And then you left everything, right? Whether it's your personal life, your profession, and then you started something drastically different. And in your wildest dream, you would not imagine that a dentist is walking on a path and becoming a coach or a facilitator or a leadership development coach or an author of a book called Emotional Grit. How did you get into this space? Because there are so many people in the corporates, they are struggling with their current job. They are not at all happy with what they are doing. And they are saying that if only I had more time, if only I had more money, I could do something different. So what was yeah. that moment in your life that you decided that yeah. this is the path that I'm going to choose? And you started walking on that path as well. And you are doing pretty well. Yeah. And I think it, it goes back to everything that we've been talking about this whole conversation is how can you understand the grit in your life and grow to greatness? Uh, and that's really what, what happened. You know, when I mentioned that I, in my rock bottom, when I left my you know, marriage. And then in the years later, I would leave this very lucrative practice. Um, the fundamental thing that I said yes to, that I said yes to was growth. And when I meant exponential growth, when I meant growing myself, I just shared one sliver of it 
improv was one thing, tennis was one thing, um, saying yes to all aspects of growth. So that meant I started a nonprofit to help with um, women and girls with their self-confidence. That led me to speaking more about my story and the story that I've shared with you today, which led me and it was like following the breadcrumbs, right? I didn't have any agenda. I didn't have, it was just me saying yes and saying yes to growth. And that led me to going to Stanford in California to a nonprofit management, um, basically an executive uh, uh, degree that I would then pursue and get. Not really a degree, but it was a, you know, it was one of those uh, courses that you would take, right? Because I wanted to really understand and learn how to make this nonprofit better. And so it was really, when you ask yourself, how can I become better? How can I uh, take advantage of opportunities around me. I became a voracious reader about all things self self growth and self self development. Like I would, you know, I was listening to all of these different podcasts while I would drive to my dental office, um, while I would study all of these things around nonprofits and how you know leaders at that level think. And so that led me to conferences around poverty alleviation around the world, where I was with people who. Who were um, who were Nobel laureates and who were nominated Nobel, Nobel laureates fighting poverty in in parts of Africa and in parts of Cambodia and in 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 all, all over the world and I'm like I'm I'm a dentist I'm just doing this tiny little nonprofit in Chicago but I got connected with these people doing incredible things I mean and that's when I started to know about impact investing and how. Uh, how, you know, there are really amazing um, philanthropists in the world focusing majority of their wealth on, on philanthropy. And so getting to know them, that's how I got to know uh, venture capitalists. And so, and that brought me to other conferences, which would then lead me to the startup world. And there's this huge conference in the U.S. called South by Southwest where a lot of the venture capitalists and a lot of the, the startup founders in Silicon Valley would all congregate there. And for me, because I, I was so curious, I just kept asking questions. And I was also doing my own research on the book, Emotional Grit. So while I was meeting all of these different leaders, I was just asking questions and questions, which led me to other growth conferences. Uh, which, by the way, one of them was uh, this one with Mind Valley, um, which was a company that put on all of these events throughout the world. And it was the same time that I was leading a women's group for professional women in Chicago. And one of the students from that group that I was hosting for women said, There is this incredible book that you have to read. And you talk about this a lot. And it's called Philosopher's Notes by Brian Johnson. And I, you know, I, I got the book and I was like, and instantly fell in love because it was a Cliff Snow's version of All of the Spirit Greats by Brian Johnson. And it turns out that this company called Mind Valley published the work of Brian Johnson, and which also led me to meeting Ajit, my now partner. Uh, but it was also one of the first companies, Philosopher's Notes and Brian Johnson, it would be the first company that I would actually be an angel investor in. So it was all of these things kind of, and, and that book, Philosopher's Notes, became the book that I would give away to my events for my nonprofit to help them grow their grit. But now, of course, we have our own books that we give away. So again, it was like leading all of the things. And so everyone always asks, well, how did you do that? I didn't have an agenda. I just said yes. And I wanted to work on things that I was very passionate about. And that was initially growth and initially expanding people's horizons, which led me to all of these different paths, which is where now I help leaders and I invest in leaders and businesses to help them grow to greatness as well. Yeah, this is so beautiful. It, it began with a very simple question. How can I become better and take advantage of opportunities around me? And then say yes to what you really care for and start whatever you care for, whatever you're passionate about, even if it's a small step. So thank you so much, Nita. I'm, I'm, I'm so happy that I had this conversation with you. Here's uh, one more question for you. Let's say with all the experience that you have gathered, uh, your journey from writing a book to having traveled 45 countries that you have traveled, you picked up some learning as well as a venture capitalist or angel investment is concerned, your association with startups, your partnership with different companies and 
wherever you are today, having addressed so many people, having showed the path to so many women all around the world, right? If this Nita of today has to advise the Nita of 19 years, what yeah. advice would you offer to her? And I would say, be curious and be curious and be brave because it doesn't matter what people think. People are going to have their own opinions, fall fast and make a lot of mistakes. And because the more mistakes you make, right now, you're going to learn from every single one of them. And, uh, and, and sometimes you're even going to learn in the process. And that, that process is so beautiful. And take advantage of all of those opportunities that come your way. Don't be afraid to fail because failure just means feedback. And feedback just means it's one more stepping stone on your journey. I'm sure even um, my takeaway from this conversation is be curious and be brave. Um, fall fast and make more and more mistakes, learn in the process. A friend of mine, he often tells me, uh, fail, fail again, fail faster, fail better. And, yeah. you know, today when you reflect, uh, Nita, what do you think? Is your father proud of you today? <laughs> I think he's dancing. <laughs> I think he's dancing and I think, I think they're all dancing and I think they're all just celebrating um, everything that, that we're doing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and today, if you were to ask another question from him, what would that be? Mm, uh, I would say, uh, I would say, how are things going? <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Nita. Um, thank you so much for being such a wonderful uh, guest. Uh, I think I had one of the finest conversations uh, of my life. Oh, and that. That's the amazing. Ease, the vulnerability, and the authenticity with which you carried this conversation. Hats off to you. Mm. Well, you're, an you. amazing, you're an amazing interviewer. Thank you so much, Gaurav. And uh, yeah, you have such an amazing light and it's, it's, it's what everybody needs at the moment. Till then, stay blessed.